In the interest of even-handedness and fair representation, it is only proper that the Fowl's antagonist's motivations be explained before we catch up with the twins. Gavild Hortnut could be fairly referred to as the Master Schemer, or in modern parlance, the Big Bad of this story, but Gavild would not have considered herself a villain as such, since it was her opinion that everything horrible her band visited upon humankind was richly deserved, and much more besides. And who among us would argue that she did not make a valid point? Truth be told, there were many in Haven City who secretly applauded Gavild and her group's proactive strikes against humanity. As we have already pointed out, Gavild Hortona was not human, she was a dwarf. Not a human with dwarfism, but an actual mythological dwarf. That is, mythological from a human point of view. And in fact, there were many so-called under-earthers in Haven who considered humans to be mythological and refused to believe otherwise despite skyscrapers of evidence to the contrary. Gavild was the leader of the Hortonut Seven the militant arm of the ancient Hortonut family, whose roots stretched back to a time when dwarves had cruel and noble names like Hortonut or Bludgeheart, and not ridiculous and insulting ones like Diggums and Pullchain. 10,000 years ago, when the fairy families burrowed underground to escape the rapacious nature of humanity, the dwarves had already been living under the surface and were more than a little put out by the sudden influx of creatures to their real estate. The richest of these dwarves' families was the Hortonut clan, who had amassed an absolute fortune in dwarf gold. Dwarf gold being 24 karat, 99.9% .9 pure, with just a glob of dwarf spit mixed in during the smell to toughen it up. Unfortunately, the fleeing fairies led mankind directly through the Hortonut tunnels, and the band lost most of their fortune to looting humans, which led to 10 millennia of Hortonut heists in return, as they attempted to regain their ingots. Under Gavild's leadership, the Hortonet 7 became the most successful re reclamation team of all time. And, in fact, the most famous bouillon heist in recent history can be traced back to Gavild and her band, including the Great Victorian Gold Robbery, the Wabrasig Gold Train Job, the Kerry Packer Bullion Heist, and the Brinks Map Robbery, to name but a few. And now, Gavild had her eye on the biggest prize of all, the Motherlode, which could account for more than 80% of the remaining lost gold. But she had run into a problem and decided that, since the human boy Fowl had survived her assassination attempt, he might as well help solve this problem. And so she took her delivery bag to Dalky Island. Artemis Fowl I, that is to say the father of Artemis Fowl II and husband to Angeline Fowl, was not pleased with his younger sons. He had solid reasons for his displeasure, as the twins had borrowed the foul tachyon jet without permission and ditched it in the Atlantic, barely escaping with their lives. Even more upsetting to Artemis Sr. was that then the loss of a prototype jet, then that could change the world's carbon footprint with its synthetic kerosene engine, was the fact that Beckett had borrowed, then lost, the treasured Rocketman platform shoes from his Rock Legends memorabilia collection leaving him only with Freddie Mercury's Adidas sneakers from Live Aid and David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust boots in the footwear section. The twins knew that their father was more unhappy than usual because he had summoned them to his private study, which sat a little apart from the main villa of a Martello Tower that had been restored by a firm of her heritage architects and augmented with a few necessities, such as internal walls, a suite of vintage Fritz Hansen office furniture, a dozen motion sensors disguised at rocks, wall-mounted mini-mag machine guns, bomb-proof glass, an escape submarine below the desk, more powerful broadband than the Pentagon had, a full-body scanner, a wall-sized live news multi-screen, and the Batman suit from Tim Burton's movies, which was not strictly speaking a necessity, but Artemis Sr. found it inspiring. All in all, it was pretty standard supervillain stuff, which the twins' father couldn't bear to part with, even though he claimed to be a 100% legit businessman now. But once a criminal mastermind, and so on and so forth. The twins were seated in matching Series 7's chairs that had been fabricated from recycled ocean plastics, looking on as Artemis Fowl Sr. rested his head on the desktop and kneaded his own neck. Beckett jittered in his seat. The blonde twin had been sitting in his chair for almost a minute now, and that was an insufferably extended period as far as he was concerned. Miles was also jittering, but only with his eyeballs, as he was using blinks and pupil sweeps to select letters and solve the Guardian crossword on one lens of his graphene eyeglasses. Once Miles had finished the puzzle, shaving five seconds off his personal record, he was eager to get away and back to amassing knowledge. Father, 
he said. For that neck massage to have any effect, you must really target the trigger points. At the moment, you are simply rolling neck fat. Artemis Sr. sat bolt upright. I know that, Miles, but I do not have neck fat. We do all have neck fat, Pater, honestly, Miles said, then flushed in shame that his father should be so ill-informed on the subject. Is that why you, what you think we're here, Miles? Asked Artemis Sr. Do discuss neck fat. No, said Miles. I assume we're here to discuss the missile crisis. Exactly, said Artemis Sr., somewhat self-consciously removing his hands from his neck and straightening the collar of his bay stretch cotton leisure jacket, which is emblazoned with a golden AF symbol as it came from his wife's fashion line. I simply need a moment to get my ducks in a row. Beckett stopped jittering. Do you mean to tell me we have ducks you can order to swim in formation? And Artemis Sr. sighed once more. Sometimes it seemed to the foul patriarch that sign was his main code of exaltation when dealing with his sons, either singly or as a team. Of course not. That's preposterous, Beckett. Beckett was in full agreement. I know. Ducks never do what you ask. They're worse than badgers, which are frankly... Beckett screwed up his face to deliver the next clause. Scratch, scratch, Artemis Sr. knew he shouldn't ask, but couldn't help himself. And what language might Scratch Scratch R be in? Miles jumped in. I'm no expert, Father, but I did wager Beck is speaking the language of badgers to avoid swearing in English. Miles is right, said Beckett. He is no expert. We should have recorded him saying that, as he'll probably never say it again. But I was speaking Brockish, which is what badgers speak, by the way, and it was a little sweaty. Artemis Sr. dropped his head to the desk once more and rolled his forehead along the cool aluminum surface. When he spoke, it was toward his own feet, but the tower had excellent acoustics, so the twins heard his words nevertheless. Some years ago, I was held captive by the Russian Mafia. Miles raised a finger. They refer to themselves as the Bratva these days, Father. Thank you, Miles. Well, I would refer to the ones who held me, Vasakin and Kamar, as Scritch Scritch R if you take my meaning. Miles nodded, appreciating the segue, while Beckett smiled, appreciating the rude joke and his father's excellent brockish pronunciation. And I can honestly say, continued Artemis Sr., that the two of you scare me more than that ever did. This statement shocked Miles so much he stopped mentally puzzling on the second of Godel's incompleteness theorems. Magic, he believed, was the missing factor, and focused on his father. The statement shocked Beckett so much that he could no longer be confined to a chair and jumped to his feet. We scared you, Dad! That's terrible! We would never hurt you! Not physically, perhaps, said Artemis Sr., but the emotional toll of parenting such extraordinary children have been so very high. Miles scrambled to justify the twins' shenanigans. Yes, but father, in our defense, the father DNA is positively littered with epigenetic markers passed down by generations of masterminds. So in many ways we have no option but to act as we do. I would go so far as to say that we are the victims in this. Artemis Sr. cut his son off with a slice of his hand. Spare me your verbal gymnastics, Miles. We know we both know you would win any argument you care to engage in. But let me tell you something. Winning an argument doesn't make it right. This might seem like a typical platitude, but Miles immediately realized that his father had delivered a master stroke. For any further squabbling on the twins' part would only strengthen Artemis Sr.'s position, ironically winning the argument that his father claimed he could not win. What a fit played, father, he said. No, said Artemis Sr., standing but keeping the weight off his bio-hybrid leg, which pained him in low-pressure areas or when he was anxious, as he was now. I am not playing. No more playing. Things must change absolutely. A change that will permeate every stratum of your existence. We're getting perms, said Beckett. But my hair is already curly. Artemis Sr. gave Beckett the full laser blast of a glacier blue eyes, and Miles felt a shiver trip along his spine. He could not help but wonder if this was the glare Artemis Sr. treated his lieutenants to back in the criminal empire days. Oh no, Beckett Fowl said the boy's father, wagging a finger at the blonde twin. Don't do that. Don't do what, Dad? said Beckett, but he knew what. 
It was in his father's eyes. Use a silly comet as a coping mechanism to deal with stress. Your distracting remarks are calculated to put me on the back foot. Well, in case you hadn't noticed, I don't have a back foot. Beckett was stunned. No one had ever called him on his tri this trick before, and he'd been using it for years. How do we get in perms? Continued Artemis Sr. Or, can I order ducks to swim in a formation? And a thousand other asinine questions you pull out of the bag whenever you don't feel like being responsible for your actions. Miles was almost giving the situation his full attention now. Father was playing hardball. Perhaps this time they had actually pushed him over the emotional edge. Miles thought he might try one more avenue. Father, if I might gently protest, you are in no position to lecture us about taking responsibility. After all, you've evaded taking responsibility for your actions over the decades. This indeed was a bold challenge, but Miles reasoned that shock tactics might be the only way to halt Artemis Sr.'s verbal barrage. He was completely incorrect. Artemis Sr.'s response to his son's gentle protest was as follows. You are making a mistake here, Miles, and your mistake is to believe that we are engaged in a civilized discussion like intellectual and equals, whereas in fact you have behaved appallingly and are about to be soundly disciplined. How have we behaved appallingly exactly? I feel our crimes should be listed in the interest of fairness. Artemis Sr. shrugged in an exaggerated and, Miles thought, semi-unhinged manner. How would I know exactly? It goes without saying that you haven't told me everything, Miles. Miles was taken aback. Of course I haven't told you everything. That is at the very core of what it means to be a mastermind. I never tell anybody everything. It doesn't matter, said the foul patriarch. What matters is that your mother and I are upset. Miles clasped his hands behind his back. It is not now nor has it ever been our intention to cause distress to either mother or yourself. In fact, we deny all charges. It was not our actions that led to this alleged upset, but rather the actions of those who would do us harm. Save it for the judge, son, said Artemis Sr. Because I don't care about your denials. What I do care about is this family and its well-being, physically and emotionally. So, rule number one. No more fairy-related antics. We're related to fairies, cried Beckett, forgetting the embargo on his silly questions tactic. His father shot Beckett a warning glare, but otherwise gave him a pass on that offense. That's right, continued Artemis Sr. I know all about the fairies. Our family has been friends with the people for generations, and it has cost us dearly. Your own brother Artemis died. He died. Miles interrupted. Perhaps, but it's a testament to Dr. Fowl's ingenuity and foresight that he engineered a revolutionary way back. Artemis died, shouted the twins' father, pounding the desk. Not Dr. Fowl. Artemis, your flesh and blood. Only he isn't your flesh and blood. Not the current version, anyway. He's a clone possessed by Artemis' spirit. Do you even hear what I'm saying, Miles? Do you even know how these months crushed your mother and me when we thought we had lost one of ya? I can hypothesize, said Miles. Common side effects of grief are lack of appetite, insomnia, and depression due to elevated levels of certain neurotransmitters. Beckett helped out his twin. You were heartbroken, Dad. Mom, too. Precisely, said Artemis Sr. And Artemis is not even the first foul to be lost in the war to protect fairies. Do you remember the whole of portraits in Foul Manor? Miles presumed this was rhetorical and did not answer. Everyone on the left side of that hall died because of the fairies. Thousand fairy friends forever. That's our secret motto, right? Well, it cost us. My own brother, my grandmother, two uncles. My stepsister gave her own life for a squadron of LAP paratroopers. My mother lost an eye. I lost a leg. Technically, the fairy saved you, said Miles. Blaming them for the loss of your leg is not logical. Artemis Sr. was on the point of exploding, but he calmed himself with the breathing exercise that, ironically, he had picked up for Miles. Everyone on that wall died, he enunciated quietly. 
because of a promise Red Peg Fowl made to the people centuries ago. I didn't remember any of this because they mind wiped me years ago, but Artemis stimulated my hippocampus before he left. And I realized that the fairies were attracted to us because of the residual magic in the Fowl estate. Which was the real reason you stole the estate, Miles deduced. Exactly. The only thing on those grounds now are organic vegetables. Not a single prospective foul mastermind in sight. Magic carrots, said Beckett, who still didn't quite grasp how deep in the organic manure the twins were. That's right, Beckett, said Artemis Sr. That's about as much as I'm prepared to give the fetish from now on. Magic carrots. This family will not spill one more drop of blood for the people. Miles decided to make sure he thought was an important point. If all Artemis' stories are indeed true, and they do appear to be, then, if I recall correctly, it was the fairies who saved your life when a, quite frankly, ill-advised scheme of yours went disastrously wrong in Murmansk. Artemis Sr. had reached his tolerance level for Miles' interruptions. Stand up straight, boy! He barked. Both of ya! Up straight and no fidgeting! This was perhaps the first time in their lives the twins had been spoken to in this manner by Artemis Sr., and some instinct snapped them both to attention before the conscious minds could fully digest the order. Artemis Sr. circled them like a sergeant major. I do not want to be the person I was in my previous job, he said, but it seems that reason does not work with sons of mine. So, if reason won't work, we're going to have some rules and you two are going to abide by them. Is that understood? Yes, Dad, said Beckett, and he meant it at this time. Of course, Father Mine, said Miles smoothly, not meaning it for a second. His plan was to press on with his quest for knowledge, but be a little sneakier about it. So, rule number one, no contact with the fairies whatsoever. Commodore Short and I have had several video chats in the week since you returned home from your last adventure, and the LEP have agreed to lift their surveillance in exchange for me reining in my sons. They wanted to mind wipe the Peria, but Holy managed to talk them out of it. So no fair related antics. Say, yes, father. This was a hard pill to swallow for both boys. Beckett would miss his friend, Lazuli Heights, while Miles would sorely miss the access to fairy technology. So neither spoke until Artemis Sr. repeated in a more insistent tone. Say, yes, father, like you mean it. Yes, father, shouted both boys. Good. Next, you no longer have access to Nani. Miles actually shrieked. You propose to deprive me of Nani, but she's super intelligent. It's no proposal, my boy. I'm simply doing you the courtesy of letting you know. And anyway, you are more than adequately super intelligent without her, said Artemis Sr., holding out his hand. Now to give. Miles made no move to hand over his eyeglasses, and so his father plucked them right off his face. I feel better already, said the twins' father, holding the spectacles with decisive double clicks. From now on, your eyeglasses will be just that, glasses. Artemis Sr. waved a hand over his desk to activate the smart surface and allowed the camera to scan his iris. Then he ordered Nani to deactivate herself until further notice. Once Miles had recovered from the initial shock of losing Nani, he realized that the AI was loyal to him it would only take a few minutes to work around Father's security and reactivate her. Also, Miles had hidden some Nani lights in the area. They wouldn't be super intelligent, but they would be smart enough. When I reboot the island's systems, Nani won't be a part of them, Artemis Sr. announced. You're probably thinking, so what, I can hack it any time I want. Miles didn't bother denying it. And undoubtedly you can, continued his father, but you will choose not to. Miles did not like the sound of this prediction. Artemis Sr. continued to roll out the new foul order. Sir, there will be no excursions off the island. You will not so much as take a swim in the channel without parental supervision. The dolphins will be worried, said Beckett, which was not an outlandish statement as one might think, as a side effect of being possessed by a fairy ghost some years previously. See LEP file, The Last Guardian. Beckett had become a trans-species polyglot, or, simply put, he could communicate with any human and most animals with a few exceptions, one being cats that probably understood him but didn't care to answer. 
The dolphins will get over it, said Artemis Sr. They'll moon about for a while, but they'll move on. That's just how dolphins are. It's true, said Beckett. Everyone thinks dolphins are all smiles, but that's just the shape of their faces. They could be fickle friends. Miles felt exposed without his glasses on. How long do you intend to maintain this crew regimen, Potter? His father barked a short, humorless laugh. Oh, oh, you poor boy. You think that's all of it? There is more, squeaked Miles, who would have committed quite grievously bodily harm to someone with four few red gummy snakes just about then. There's more. Artemis Sr. counted off the rules on his fingers. No internet, no access to any vehicles, no field trips, no plots, no plans, no accidentally leaving the island, no devising any linguistic or theoretical workarounds to get out of following my orders, no firearms, no weapons of any kind, no using common household objects as weapons, no cluster punching, that one specifically for you, Beckett, no climbing of any structures. Both of you must read a book every day. One book? said Miles, stamping a foot, for which he had, for some reason, thought might weaken his father's resolve. I refuse to be limited to one book. Beckett raised a hand, but Artemis Sr. anticipated his question. No, Beckett, it can't be the same book every day. And then he went on with his list, which apparently was memorized. No phones, no fraternizing with known criminals besides myself, no consorting with unknown criminals, no tempting people into the dark side. Timetable chores starting at 7 a.m. You report in to me or your mother five times a day, in person. Beckett, no more sugar or fast food. Miles, fast food for you every day. That is monstrous, protested Miles. And also bad, said Beckett. This is a punishment after all, said their father. Not a visit to the Seltzer Fountain. Miles frowned. Amazingly, I don't get that reference. Good, snapped his father. And let me tell you, my boy, no one even listens to your references. They're so obscure. This was a rare demeaning comment from the foul father, but perhaps he could be forgiven, considering the circumstances. Some people listen to my references, said Miles, edging close to a sulk. It's not as though I'm a Mavorian friar expounding on DNA theories in an Augustian monastery. Artemis Sr. waited a moment to see if Miles was being sarcastic, but apparently he was not. I rest my case, he said. So, that's almost it. Your new life starts immediately. Artemis Sr. sat down at his desk and massaged both temples, which did little to alleviate the stress he was under. It is, in fact, astounding to think that, were Artemis Fowl Sr. stress levels to be graphed, it would be apparent that it had not spiked to this extent, since Artemis Jr. was involved in basically shutting down the world some years previously, during what the media now referred to as the Big Dark. In spite of your monumental lack of regard for your parents' feelings, we continue to love you both. Your mother, in fact, adores you, though I find myself the shrine wearing off after a while. Nevertheless, I will keep you alive if it kills me, and I would rather have you alive in a virtual prison than killed during some fabulous adventure. May I ask? began Miles. No, you may not, said his father. What you may do is report to your mother in the main house. She has a list of chores for you. Miles bowed. Very well, father, he said, already plotting how to circumvent these new rules, most especially the ones about not circumventing the rules. Ha! said Artemis Sr. I see what you're doing. I know that face. What the face? asked Miles. His father waggled a finger towards Miles' general feature area. That one, the eager to please one. We all know that face, Miles. <laughs> we do! agreed Beckett. He's planning. It's as plain as the face on his... face. I know what you're thinking, son, said Artemis Sr. You're thinking, how can Father stop me from breaking his rules? If the entire LAP couldn't stop me, how now could he? Miles nodded, even though he had actually been miles away, wondering whether Lazuli would allow him to take a patch of her blue skin for testing. A six-inch square should be more than sufficient, and she'd make sure to include some of the yellow markings when excising the sample. Miles wasn't really thinking about breaking his father's rules, because Miles felt, in all humanity, that this goal would be well within his intellectual means. Yes, father mine, said Miles, try not to look too innocent. That's exactly the problem I've been ruminating on. However, I see now that it's as unsolvable as Goodell's incompleteness theorems. 
The first of which I've already solved, thought Miles. The first of which you have undoubtedly already solved, continued Artemis Sr. The missing variable in the second is magic, in case you're interested. And this simple statement brought home to Miles how much he had underestimated his own father and how much trouble they actually were in. So how do I intend to make you stick to the rules? And continued Artemis Sr. Allow me to enlighten you. What I'm going to do is as follows. Nothing. You two are going to police each other, and I will invoke your most sacred vow to make you do it. Since Miles was actually listening now, he caught on immediately. You wouldn't. That's not a place you can go. Is it lollipops? Asked Beckett, vaguely aware that Artemis Jr. had always detested lollipops and everything that most meaning of candy stood for. Are you going to make us eat lollipops? Because I'm telling you right now that I love lollipops, so that will backfire big time. Miles grabbed his twin by the shoulders and shook the lollipop notion right out of his brain. Don't you see, Beck? He said. Father plans to force us to make a wrist bump promise. Beckett was puzzled. But that's our thing. No one can make us do a wrist bump. Beckett is correct, Father, said Miles, frowning quite severely. Only a foul twin can initiate the sacred gesture. That code is involatile, and neither God nor mortal man can force us to bump scars. Bump scars, said Artemis Sr. Do it now. Dad, said Beckett on the verge of tears. I know we just joined your jet, but this is serious. Artemis Sr. was undeterred. I said bump wrist, or heaven help me, I shall be quite cross with you both for several days. And while your mother and I will continue to love you, we will not like you for a while. That was enough for Beckett. His mind could not accommodate the idea of his parents not liking him for so much as a moment. Miles, he said. We should bump. But Miles wasn't there yet. Wrist bumping went to the very core of what it meant to be a foul twin. I appeal to your father, said Miles. I do not co-opt a ritual into your disciplinary program. We are fouls and certain things are sacrosanct to us. Honor for one. Artemis Sr. had no trouble meeting his son's eyes. Love trumps honor, he said. Now bump. Please, father. Dad. Father slash dad laughed. Ha, <laughs> dad. It's dad now. You must be desperate, son. Bump. Or so help me, you're both going down to my bad book. And my bad book does not make for good reading. Miles let that atrocious metaphor pass and looked to Beckett, whose left hand was already in position to receive the bump. Whenever you're ready, my boy, said Artemis Sr. And Miles knew the battle was lost. They were being tied into their father's conditions by a contract of their own devising, a wrist bump promise. Miles raised his hand slowly, searching his mind for some way to void the promise. Perhaps the scars were not precisely aligned? Honor the bump, Miles, warned Artemis Sr. No crossing your fingers and no such nonsense. You said it yourself, the bump is sacred. Miles' vision was blurred now, perhaps from the myopia, or perhaps from the intensity of his concentration. But it seemed to him that Beckett's pink scar glowed, and he felt his own scar twitch in response, seeking the contact. If we freeze this moment and examine the psychology, some might say that all this pavilar seems to a bit much for something that amounts to little more than a pinky promise. But those people hugely underestimate the power of a connection between those born of the same pregnancy. Twins are often at a loss to describe this connection to the singletons, but Miles Fowl, unsurprisingly, has tried. He hypothesized in an article for the Journal of Biological Sciences that Regarding the emotional pull that exists between twins, we are permanently bound beyond each other's event horizons, so to speak, and the mental fortitude necessary to escape that force could possibly have actual physical implications for the amygdala. While Beckett once wrote in Rainbow Pencil for his English teacher that, Miles is like the other me, but boring. Both boys were correct. And the sacred wrist bump was a potent reminder to the foul twins of their mental and physical bond. As babies in their double cradle, the twins often slept with their scars aligned, which supposedly reminded them of their time in the womb, and since those days they had used the wrist bump to seal every promise they had made to each other. It was their thing, their gesture. No one had ever forced it upon them. Until now. 
Miles lifted his hand, and the closer it moved to Beckett's wrist, the stronger the attraction grew until the scars sinked and the twins felt a wave of contentment wash over them, smothering their anxiety somewhat. Artemis Sr. felt jealous of their zen calm. I wish I had a mystical scar, he said. Better than yoga. Now promise you will do as I say. What do you promise? said Miles, a little too quickly. Artemis Sr. zipped up his top to his chin. One last desperate roll of the dice, eh, son? Now do it properly. Say the magic words. We will do as you say, said the twins in unison. Risp on promise. Their father was satisfied. And so it shall be. Miles lowered his hand, coming out of the shared mindset into the real world. And now I suppose we must seek out the mother in the main house and get busy with our chores. Miles said the word chores with the contempt he usually reserved for Einstein. Just you, Miles, said Artemis Sr., and their angry slash in his brow softened. Beckett has a job to do. A person didn't have to be a genius to figure out what that job might be, but Miles was a genius, and so he figured it all out the faster, and his heart ached for his brother.